As the dust settles with Javier Miley's electoral win for Argentina's president, American libertarians can get back to doing what they do best, criticizing each other and the Libertarian Party. Despite the howls and criticism resulting in poor results, that is, convincing each other to do things differently, many continue to cling to their sunk cost more firmly than their liberties. Today, the Liberty Dad Show breaks that trend and brings on LNC treasurer to uh, Todd Hagopian to discuss the most recent end of month financials and what they mean. So let's get Todd in here. Again, you're being an activist. I am not, not. That's not appropriate, sir. Yeah. If you, who, who are you asking? What's your name? That's not an appropriate question for you to ask. I do, I you're going to ask how many questions? You get three? You're a stupid son of a bitch. All right, folks. A couple quick things to mention here. This show is pre-recorded because Todd and I just couldn't get schedules aligned for a live stream. Uh, that may be upsetting for the critics who wanted to come in and stir up trouble in the comments, uh, but better luck next time. In full transparency, I provided Todd my questions ahead of time, with the exception of one or two. That's atypical from the Friendly Fire podcast or show, as the goal is to challenge my fellow libertarians, but without embarrassing them. The business meetings do not vote on Treasurer's report because it's a record of transactions. They either happened or they didn't. Therefore, I was comfortable giving Todd a heads up. His answers will either match the numbers or they won't. And finally, while I aim to ask challenging questions, my goal is not to embarrass him or the LNC. If his answers are poor, or if the LNC has made poor decisions, everyone will be able to see it, probably already has. No, one, no need to rub anyone's nose in it. All we're here to do is just talk frankly and honestly. Out of the way, with that out of the way, Todd, how are you? I'm great. How are you? <laughs> oh, you know, I couldn't be better. Um, still trying to get a couple of things worked out here on the stream. I was running behind, running behind. I'm always running behind, right? And so it's just, it's always this big challenge. And I don't have a producer to yell at. So I can only yell at myself, which is not terribly exciting. So <laughs> let me get a couple of things up on the screen here. And uh, then we will, uh, we will get going. So, <clears throat> uh, Let's kind of discuss. Let's 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 get right into it, and I'll get those on the screen. Uh, just my little scrolling, my little marquee. I'll get that going once you start talking. So let's pull some stuff up here. So I have the September end of month financial report, and um, you know the first thing that I want to talk about is the very first graph that's on the uh, the sustaining members. So let's pull that up. Now let me move some. Let me move some things around on the screen so I can better see what I want to see here. So let's go here and we're going to, I thought I had this all set up and terribly I did not. So let's go with one. There we are. And how about there? There we are. Get a little bit. Bigger. I thought there was a way for me to. Nope, oh, that's not what I want. Let's go back to this. Okay, this will work. Okay, so looking at these numbers, I want to point out to some to people that I added some of my own coloring because I thought it was very interesting. Todd, you can tell me whether or not this is uh, an appropriate way to look at this particular chart. But in green, I have the presidential years, and then in yellow, I have the midterm years, which leaves uh, all the other years. Um, just kind of sitting there. Um, so is is that first a good way to look at this particular chart, do you suppose, in terms of finances? Yeah, actually, both membership and finances, it's a great way to look at charts in general. Uh, we should be looking at four-year cycles and comparing the year to the previous year in the previous cycle. So like 2023 would be the equivalent of 2019 in the last election cycle. Okay, awesome. So with that out of the way, now we we know how we're supposed to be looking at this. I'm gonna margin it just a little bit. I think that works a little bit better. So I, I have my questions on it. 2023 is the year after midterms, which coincides with 2019, 2015, 2011, and 2007. So what is your takeaway 
on why 2023 is lower than the years 2016 through 2022, because 2015 is the only year that even really, I mean, I, mean, I guess you can look at 2006, uh, but if we're comparing like numbers to like numbers, then 2015 is really the only year that kind of comes close. So what's your takeaway? Well, if you look back through 2008 there, there's really only two post-election years where membership rises. So typically you will see a membership drop off after an election year to some degree. Or obviously by the chart, you can see that it's larger here. And so one of the things you and I talked about is there's two times when membership will typically drop off. One post-election, and that's usually just a you know, exit of excitement based mm -hmm. on, um, based on, you know, you get a bunch of people excited and then they may or may not rejoin or renew the following year. And there's not as much getting people, new people excited uh, during a non-election year. So you lose renewals and then you don't get as many joins and that causes membership to go down. The other thing is obviously party turmoil. If you have party turmoil, there are going to be people that are deciding not to renew. There are going to be people that are deciding not to give as much, you know, and these kinds of things. So obviously 2023 is probably a great example of a year when we have both. Gotcha. Um, do, you, do you anticipate this getting better or worse? And I know that's kind of like a, basically a swag, you know, a scientific <laughs> wild ass guess. Um, yeah. But just if you had to guess, what would well, you, what does your gut say? Yeah, I mean, typically in an election year, specifically presidential election years, mm -hmm. you do see you do see it going up, right? So you can see back there in the four presidential years that you've got noted, there's only one that was a mild upward and everything else was pretty dramatic upward. Right. Um, so we do get a lot more excitement during presidential years. You've got, you know, usually big races in most states. And then on top of that, a presidential candidate to rally around. Um, I would anticipate that it starts to turn around. Do I think we're going to get a huge spike? That's probably going to have to do with who our nominee is right. and, and how fractured the party is after a convention. Gotcha. Okay. Um, let's see. Let's move on to, so here's an interesting thing. So I wanted, I wanted to talk about the membership in specific because one of the things that I learned, and I learned this through a combination of this report and then my own personal experience. So a while back, and we talked about this, my, uh, my membership card showed that it had expired. I was doing some cleaning on my desk and I looked at my card and it showed that, I believe it showed September. And this was in October. And I was like, oh, like my membership expired. And I was like, I didn't get a renewal letter. And so I looked in my email and I didn't say anything. And I know I hadn't seen one in um in the snail mail so i reached out about renewing and the email response to me uh said hey you donated fifty dollars to a theme contest earlier in the year so therefore your membership ha uh, has extended um i think it was till june of 2024 uh, to be a sustaining member so that was new to me because apparently in our bylaws if you donate money 25 dollars or more then that puts you as a sustaining member. Um, am I missing anything there so far on, on the bylaws? Uh, no, $25 or more donation over a 12 month period of time, along with signing the non-aggression principle. Right. Um, and, uh, and that goes for any donation of any kind, right? No matter, it doesn't have to be, does, it doesn't matter, correct? There's a little bit of, there's a little bit of discussion about that. Uh, there's a little bit of disruption about whether or not convention tickets and merchandise count in that or not. Okay. Um, but yeah, it's supposed to be uh, based on how the CRM grabs BSM. It's grabbing it without donations to merch and convention. Right. Um, there's some discussion over whether in the past we've we've grabbed it a different way or not. And and frankly, the bylaws don't really tell you how to grab it. It says donation. So then you have to, you know, have that discussion on is a merchandise purchase a donation is a convention ticket cost a donation. Not sure. Gotcha. So continuing on with my little story here, just because I want to have a conversation about this membership thing. Um, 
So I got that email response. And then literally about a week later, I got a snail mail letter and it um, said, hey, it looks like it's time for you to renew. And actually the techno, uh, the, the specific language said, quote, either recently expired or nearing its expiration date. So I was a little annoyed by that. And I know it's not it's not your fault necessarily. Um, so then I, uh, I, I sent an email, uh, you know, I, I, I responded back to the email that I had received and said, hey, I got this snail mail letter actually. And turns out there's conflicting information. On one hand, I'm being told that my membership is sustaining. On the other hand, it's I'm being told that it's lapsed. And I was like, what's going on here? And so then I got a final response indicating that my membership was indeed in good standing. They're two separate columns. Um, and that basically you had one per because they were they came from two different people. And okay. so both of them were looking at two different columns. So that got me thinking, and this is one of the new questions that I have for you, is do you know if we can distinguish between members who have intentionally paid for a membership, like here's my $25, I want to be a member, and members who have contributed to $25 for some other reason, you know, supporting anything that the, you know, any kind of donation whatsoever? Yes. Um, so your convention naming contest, for example, would have a code associated with that in the CRM. Uh, so I would be able to see what you donated to. Not everything has a code, but that one specifically does. You know what I mean? Merchandise has a code. Um, I believe that membership has a code and then other donations has a code based on the clicks that you do on the website. Um, now, could how easy would it be to to pull a report like that that gets into how you know bad the crm is to use right so okay. part of part of the issue that you're talking about here is um one person pulled a report that that looked for bsms and said yes dl you're a bsm you know the other person looked for a report on who bought a membership in the past year and hasn't renewed Mm -hmm. Okay, DL, you bought a membership in the past year and haven't renewed it. Do you know what I mean? So right. like, so and, and the CRM doesn't have triggers where it can tell you, you know, hey, don't call D, DL, he, he just did this $50 thing, or maybe we should have, but we should have worded it differently. You know what I mean? Right. Um, and then on top of that, I think another issue that you might have run into based on what you just said, and it's an issue that Karen Ann and I were talking about the other day and a couple other people, but um, many people have multiple profiles in CRM because of whatever reason, like I donated when I was in Ohio and then I donated when I was in Oklahoma, you know, so I have multiple profiles. So like one profile could suddenly seem like I'm not a member and I get some random letter, even though the other profile I've already paid or I'm a lifetime mm -hmm. member. Do you know what I mean? And that yeah. frustrates people. And this is just a, a matter of how the CRM is put together and some of the things like people, people like to poo poo all the stuff that people have been talking about the CRM, this CRM, that, but there are problems. They, these are the things that get caused when the CRM is not working correctly. Um, you know, my membership card says I, I was a member in 2017, my first FEC contribution, you know, in, in, in the, on the website is 2019, mm -hmm. you know, so like, something got screwed up there. <laughs> like, right. obviously, remember, because I got a card, you know what I mean? Like, so these kinds of things happen. Um, so I don't know how else to say it other than that CRM needs to get cleaner. And that's what we've been working towards. And it's just mm -hmm. been a slog. Right? No, I, so I work with data all the time. And I do yeah. understand the challenges that come with it. Um, and there are a lot of considerations. Now, I will say, now, you don't need to make any comment here mm -hmm. um i will just kind of give my two cents because it, you know at this point now we are recording this for other people to see i will say that i think one of the you know and i'm sure there are many priorities one of the priorities that the lnc needs to have is to identify um one way to pull this information and to determine you know um you know because two individuals were giving me two different answers yep. and i felt like that was a bit of a problem because we are in a situation where you know people are being very critical uh, about the information and so i think it's you know one of the things that we need to see is something more consistent 
But on the other hand, I'm not going to give the current LNC too difficult of a time because uh, the first thing I would have to know is how frequently has this been done? How frequently have reports been pulled that differed in information? Um, sure. I assume it's not just this LNC. Uh, but if it is, well, then we're back to, you know, criticism and saying, hey, let's figure this out so that we yeah. get so people like me know exactly where I stand and I'm getting the right information. Because yeah. I tell you what, you send me an email that says, hey, you need to re-up. You, you know, you might or, you may or may not get a response from me because I'm terrible about email. Yeah. You know, I, it just so happened that I got one in the mail. And in the other case, I specifically reached out. So when I got a response, I was I was waiting for it. Yeah. And that's fair. And and just to be clear, you're not the only one. So like I was given 150 names to follow up on mm -hmm. and frequently got the response that I'm a lifetime member or I renewed two months ago, mm -hmm. you know, or this and that. And, you know, I'm I'm the treasurer. I got 150 names. I'm following up with these people and and frequently got that answer. Um, and I was told, you know, this is the situation. They are, they have missed renewal as of X, Y, Z, you know what I mean? And it just wasn't the case. Um, so, so there is an issue with the data from a previous LNC to this LNC. I'm not gonna, I don't know the previous LNC, what they're, how often this happened with them. What I can tell you is what this LNC did do right or wrong mm -hmm. was this was a multiple year migration towards Civi CRM. Right. And staff had wanted to cut out Razor's Edge for a long time and move fully to Civi CRM so that there is only one CRM system, not two. Mm -hmm. And this LNC said yes to the staff middle of 2022 and allowed for that migration to happen. Um, and that supposedly the story is, is that that stopped some of the ease of getting this information and ease of going after renewals mm -hmm. is the story. I don't know. It, it's hard to, it's hard to track like how bad this is now versus how bad it was before, you know? Right. I mean? Right. So. Uh, yeah, I understand. And it's, it, it uh, see, this is part of the reason that I wanted to bring you on is I wanted to have a conversation. I wanted to ask my questions yeah. because I know that other people raise a lot of questions and sometimes they're good. And then sometimes they raise some criticism and, and it's not so good. Um, and when it comes to data in reporting, um, libertarians have themselves criticized entities, namely the government, for changing how they report things, which can make things look better or worse. Um, and sometimes it's intentional. Sometimes it's, hey, we did something, we made a change, and maybe we shouldn't have done this, yeah. uh, whatever the case may be. So I want to be very careful in how I criticize because at the end of the day, all I care about is what do the numbers say and sure. then what do we need to do? Now, here's another question that, that I kind of just thought of. Um, do uh, I, I don't know if I can actually, actually ask this question, but I'm going to put it out there. Maybe not as a question, uh, maybe more as a re request. I would like to see what the sustaining members look like over the you know over the years of people who explicitly signed up because for instance i didn't know that my 50 dollar contribution went toward a membership initially yeah. um which is fine like i don't like i personally i think that's a i think that bylaw needs to be changed because i just don't i don't think that is good personally but i didn't know about it right so i'm under the impression that a sustaining member is somebody who says here's my 25 dollars or whatever money that i'm donating and I would like it to be uh, go toward me being a member of the party. Right? I'm specifically donating to be a member of this party. And so for me, uh, I would like to see that information teased out from any of the donations, because what would be very interesting, I think, would be to know what kind of drop is there? Like, would the drop be larger from, say, 2022 to 2023, or would it be smaller? Right. Um, and I think that would be very useful information, especially right now. Now, I, I could see where maybe the LNC might pull those numbers and it makes it, you know, makes things look worse. Um, so, you know, it's kind of a toss up, but I would yeah, like. I, to think, uh, I think, frankly, that would be a huge, huge undertaking, given the current CRM mm -hmm. and our and our folks have better things to do 
than to do it. That said, I get why you want it, but like, not to mention we had two CRMs going back. So I don't even know if we have the numbers for the second CRM. Do you know what I mean? Like right. there, there would be trouble, but it would also just be a huge undertaking given how hard it is to pull the reports and how much work has been done to improve the reports over the last year. Mm-hmm. So like prior to the last year, could they be, I don't know if they went backwards or not. My assumption is they didn't, you know what I mean? They fixed the reports moving forward, but I don't know for sure. So that's that would be my concern more than anything. It's just a matter of, you know, time and the value of that time and what else they've got working on right now. Sure. Um, well, but I get it. I get what you're saying. And then I also agree with you, by the way, like the OKLP, you know, a membership counts as a membership. Everything else is extra, you know, mm-hmm. and, and obviously we can't change the bylaws, but that um, that's where my head's at, too. And it also makes fundraising much easier, like. People expect to renew memberships and then the, and any donation on top of that should be extra. You know, that's, right. that's how it should work, but it doesn't. So it doesn't. So. Right. Well, anyway, that's just part of the conversation that, you know, that yeah. I think is worth having. So let's move on to the next chart. Cause you know, I know we're both uh, very busy people and we don't want to, uh, we want to keep this going. So here's the revenue for 20 years. Um, let's make that a little bit bigger here. All right. So this one is probably an easy one. Now I'm going to put my cards on the table for people. I do not read financial reports. So I may ask questions that are in ignorance. Um, but I assume that other people in the party, uh, do not read financial reports either. So I'm comfortable putting myself out there and saying, all right, here's this question I have. What, what say you, and we'll go there. So, um, in this particular chart, uh, let's see where the target. So we have two. Uh, I'm sorry. Am I, am I looking at them? Oh, yes. I'm sorry. I was jumping ahead to the next question that I had. So my bad. So why is the projected revenue so low in 2023? Yeah. So <clears throat> a couple of reasons. So first, first off, let's talk about how they do this chart, which is probably not the best way. It's straight lines, which I've talked about over and over again, is not the right way to do the chart, but also uh, don't want to change things that have been done for years. So, for example, we're already, as of October, report that'll come out, we're at 915 in revenue. Mm-hmm. So we're clearly going to get over a million, you know, and this is showing under a million. Um, so it's just they they take a straight line and decide, you know, pump it out through the year. So chances are we'll be in the one, two range. Um, uh, but why is it down? It's down for the same two reasons I said before, you know lower membership drives uh, lower fundraising. So we typically will end up getting a certain dollar per member per year, and that's in a relative range. You know what I mean? So if you lose a couple thousand members and and you're making 60 bucks a member, you know, you're going to lose a lot of money. Um, And then on top of that, if you don't have events, so for example, a lot of times people don't like to remember this, but 2022, we had a convention that brought in over $500,000. Mm-hmm. And that's in those numbers. Okay. So take out the convention, you know, and it drops 500 grand, you know, and so same thing with 2020 and 2018 and 2016. And now all of a sudden, 1.2 doesn't look, you know, obscene. It's still bad, but it doesn't look obscene because all of these big years that you're seeing are dropping $500,000 you know, or 300,000, whatever that year's convention was. So, so it's a bad year, no sugarcoating it. It's a bad year because low membership, it's a bad year because infighting in the party. Um, But there is something to this chart that this chart is terrible. Let's put it that way. It's just one of those things that it's legacy and I don't feel like I can take it out. Otherwise I'm doing what you said at the beginning and saying like, wow, this is a dumb way to look at it. So we're not going to do it anymore. You know, right. No, I, I agree. And I think I think we run the risk of having, um, you know, more questions uh, th- that that don't bring edification to the party when you just if you start changing the way you do it. Now, I, I think in addition would be a good thing. And then maybe mm-hmm. saying, all right, we're going to add this new chart in, but yeah. we're going to phase it in and phase the other one out. That yeah. way, people feel confident that, hey, we've just found a better way to present the information. Uh, yeah. You know, so when I was saying earlier, like split it out, split it apart, 
that would be in addition to. So I do understand like, hey, if we have to pull this chart because we're not just going to dump it and we're gonna, now going to add two additional charts, yeah. right? Uh, that's more work that has to be done. Mm -hmm. um, and then you have to, because they would be new charts, you have to make sure that, hey, you have to validate everything. Yeah. Uh, so that your numbers are good and they and they do say what they appear to say and that there was nothing you know that needed to be adjusted in pulling that report yeah i totally understand it um you know but this is just one of the things that jumped out at me because i was like yeah. hey wow it's it, it is a huge drop and it's <clears throat> uh, unfortunately in, unless you look at 2009 and 2015 it's a fairly significant drop from most years i would say yeah, yeah. um you know, and I would have to look at the numbers a little bit more closely uh, to, to make any more comparisons than that. But just kind of offhand, I was like, wow, that really stands out. Yeah. I mean, so, so for example, last year would have been like, let's see, I don't have enough. Last year probably would have been like one five and this mm -hmm. year will be like one two. So, I mean, it, it is a significant jump or a drop, but it's not, you know, it, it is not anywhere near what it looks like, but right. um but what I did like about that conversation there is, could I make a non-convention version of this, you know, and drop it in also so that the numbers shrink and we can kind of see the actual non-convention trend? Yes. Could I do a non-convention dollars per member? And that, that flattens out the membership ups and downs. So then you can see if the members are donating 60 bucks or 80 bucks. Yeah. So, I mean, there's other charts that we could, put in here. But again, I, I'm always, I'm always just a little fearful of like, you know, not trying to, not trying to make us look good. That's not the point of the treasure. I know some people think that's what I do. That's not what I do. Otherwise I would have changed all this. So, right. Yep. All right. Awesome. Well, let's move on to the, uh, to the third chart and then we're going to, uh, I've got some, you know, general questions and whatnot. Um, so this one is the one that I started on a moment ago. It's the reserve adequacy. Um, so I noticed that the target is higher in Q4 2021, but it does show a slight dip from December 2022 and January 2021. So you got that little slight dip there. I don't think my mouse actually shows up on the screen. Um, so what is going on here? What are we what are we looking at when we when we see this reserve adequacy and we're looking at the the reserve target and the reserve? Mm -hmm. Because we also see a huge fluctuation with the reserve, which I get. I mean, you know, money, you either have money or you don't. Um, but, but what is this chart telling us? Yeah, sure. So the reserve target is based on how much money it costs to run the party. So as we um, do a new budget and they look at fixed costs that we've got in that budget, the new reserve target is set. So that's the reserve target there from the beginning of 2023. It essentially says that if we have $74,000 in our cash reserve uh, or like cash reserve, that we can um, manage the manage the ups and downs. The, the previous LMCs have decided that this is the equation that that reserve target is going to be based on. And I think they even raised it at some point right before we took over, which was fine. I'm a big fan of having higher than reserve target, as you see here. You know, this is the lowest point that we've been. Um, so I'm a big fan of keeping above the reserve target uh, and have toyed with whether we should raise it as well. Um, but basically, that's all it is, is your ability to meet your bills over the next couple of months. That's okay. what the reserve target is. Um, so why are we seeing it going down? A few reasons. One, um, due to poor fundraising, we put a lot of money into fundraising expense. So that's something you've seen over the last couple of months. You'll see again here in October that a lot of money went into fundraising expense. So expenses went up. Um, usually when you put money into fundraising expense, it takes a couple of months to turn into actual fundraising. As you heard, we did about 180,000 in October. Um, so yes, it worked. You know what I mean? We put money in and now money's coming out, but it doesn't happen the same month that you put money in. Um, so that was part of it. The other part of it was ballot access petitioning started. Um, so, and we knew that. And so that's the other thing is we make a budget. We know when certain things are going to come out. And so there was never a plan to keep $250,000 of reserve the whole year. There's no reason for that. We're not a for-profit business. You know what I mean? 
it will keep $250,000 in there long enough so that we can start funding ballot access when we need to. And then that's what we're doing now. So in next month's financials, you'll see the reserve pop back up because of the good fundraising month. Um, so we'll be in the 140 range, I think. Um, and uh, and we're still funding ballot access. So we're still about twice the reserve and, and funding ballot access freely. Okay. All right. So let me bring you back up on the screen here and we'll move away from the charts where I have questions. And so again, a moment ago, I said, you know what? I don't really read financial reports. Like I can look at this and kind of make some estimations on some things, but that's just not really my wheelhouse. Um, and I, I imagine that many other members are. So for other members who may not be familiar with financial reports, if they're looking at this and they're trying to make heads or tails of what's going on, what page or chart has the best takeaway yeah. for them? And I have it so I can put it on screen if you'd like. Yeah, I'm pulling it up here so I can kind of look through. Um, the one, the one chart on page three that you didn't go through just gives you in general how revenue and expenses are going over time. You know what I mean? So if you see that going sideways for a long period of time, so that would be page three, chart two, you know, right there. Sorry, up one more. Oh, the, the, the first one? Yeah. Yeah, it just that just in general tells you like you can see here where I said the expenses were rising because we were dropping money into marketing. You know right. what I mean? So the expenses were rising. Now you have to see revenue come up. Now you're going to see revenue pop up to like 180 next month. You know what I mean? So like that's a good chart just to be like, hey, is stuff going sideways? Because like under the previous LNC, as I've talked about before, you know, the spending was too was kind of stayed high when fundraising dried up a little bit. And then that's when, if you go down to the chart below, go down to that one, you see where the cash reserve adequacy fell to almost negative 50. That's right. because suddenly we were spending way more than we were bringing in, but it didn't happen in one month. It happened over time. So that's where I say that second chart can kind of tell you, like if, if you didn't see that revenue starting to creep back up, then and you saw my red line going high for multiple months in a row, like mm -hmm. that's a big, that's a big, what the heck, you know, we need to, we need to get this under control, but we don't, but we are seeing the blue pop back up. So it's going to plan to plan, you know, we, we wish we had more, but it's doing what it's supposed to be doing. The other page um, that I would probably look at, and it is a, it is eye chart, um, but it tells you, let me see if there's an easier version of this page. Um, yeah, probably if you were to look at page four, the P and L account summary by month. Yeah. That guy right there. And okay. I know that that's going to be hard for people to see here. Um, but basically this is the simple P and L where you can see total revenue and total expenses, you know, and then what was our net operating quote unquote income? We're not a business, but income. Um, and this is another one where you can just see, okay, like our, is our revenue going up or down? Is it going, uh, our expenses going up or down? And then our expenses here are kind of chunked into nice categories where you can get an idea. So if you look the first three months of the year, fundraising expense, 16, mm -hmm. 16, 13, the last four months, 24, 50, 23, 24. Do you know what I mean? So we're uh, throwing I understand my eyes. I pulled it up on a different, oh, sorry. Uh, so which, which month? Okay, so if you look at the first three months. Oh, gotcha. Fundraising expense, you're looking at 16, I, I turned it off, 16, okay. 16, 13, you know? And if you look at the last four months, 24, 50, 23, 24. You know what I mean? So you can see that, what I told you a minute ago isn't BS. Like we're throwing money at fundraising. We're trying to drive fundraising back up. Um, so this is how you kind of check everybody to see what we're paying on. You also see that salary used to be 40 a month. We've lowered it down. You know, uh, I guess it's pretty similar. Overhead, professional services. This is where 
um, you can see some of this stuff. You're going to have to go into the deeper P&L to figure out what's going on. Um, but professional services, there's a lot of legal and accounting in there. You know what I mean? So eyes wide open. We've gotten a lot of flack for that. There's been some legal and accounting expenses. It's right there. People can see it and then they can dig in on the next page, you know, and get into the actual P&L. So if you want to know what professional services is, you go down to page five and page six and you can dive in. So that's probably what I would tell people is like, look at the summary and then grab the number that you're interested in. So if you want to know what our fundraising expense bump was, go and see what we were doing. Were we trying to get recurring members? Were, was it general fundraising? You know, was it ballot access fundraising expense? You know, there it so is. this is actually the revenue portion, which is also good to look at because you can see where our revenue is coming from. Mm -hmm. um, and then if you continue down, you'll see the expenses. Uh, but the revenue portion here shows you, you know, where we're getting our revenue from, which is interesting. But yeah, the expenses is an eye chart. So you really got to want to go into it. But but if you have a question, like if you hit the summary, you know, you can dive into here. And the other thing that people don't do often enough is you can just send me an email and I respond. You know what I mean? Like that's a lot easier, by the way, than making 13 Twitter posts and 18 Facebook posts. Call me an idiot. Like you can actually just email me and I'll answer your question. You know, then you can call me an idiot if you want. But it's like, right. <laughs> but it's pretty simple and I get the emails and I answer them and I don't ignore them. It's pretty easy process. <laughs> so, okay. And awesome. usually if it's a good question, you'll see me put it on the LNC business page. You'll see every now and then like the ballot access question yesterday, I put right on the business page because somebody asked a good question. So I put it out there so that people could see the answer, you know? Gotcha. Okay. Awesome. So <laughs> going back up real quick, um, just to let people um, so if you look at the uh, the PL uh, on page, oh, this is page five. Let's go back up one more. So on page four, yeah, th there we go. There we are. Um, this gives you the summary, folks. So then yeah. you can look over to the left here. Let me let me kind of get this aligned up a little bit better on the screen. Um, so you can look at the left. You can see where we've got revenue, we've got expenses, and then you have the general. Uh, the, the, the general item, fundraising, convention and special events, um, you know, salaries, program related expenses, so on and so forth. And then if you're like, okay, why are the, you know, what do these numbers, how, how are they made up? Then you can go to the expanded version down on page five and six, and then you can look at them specifically. And then you can, if you have a question, reach out to Todd and say, hey, what's going on here? What does this mean? so on and so forth right did i get all yeah. that right Is that a good summary exactly right yep all right perfect look at that i'm learning finance right here <laughs> on the job on the podcasting job guys so <laughs> you can too we don't have to flame people on the internet we can just ask simple questions and figure out where things are because yep. at the end of the day if we care about the party then the first and foremost thing is to not yell and scream at people, but to have the best understanding and then say, all right, now what can we do to resolve yeah. this? So, yeah. okay. So I've got a couple questions here. So what I did folks, I did something very interesting. I have a buddy of mine that I, you know, I talk about him all the time. His name is Steve. And, um, I just said, Hey Steve, I want you to take a look at this report and give me a few questions that I could ask Todd just now, Steve does not care about the libertarian party. If the libertarian party grew, and we started getting people elected, he'd probably take a look into it and see if there's anybody that he wanted to support. But if we faded away into nothing, he would not be bothered because he doesn't plan on voting for libertarians anyway. Um, I am probably his favorite and only libertarian that he associates with. So I asked him, so here are the questions. Now, two, one of the questions we've already covered because he had a similar question to me, and that was why is the projection so low in 2023 compared to other similar years? You just answered that a few moments ago, so we're not going to rehash that one. Then the next two were more like comments, so I kind of phrased them as questions. And he said, first, uh, this the, the second item that he pointed out, he said, it just looks like, just scanning over, he didn't do a deep dive, he just did a scan. He said, it looks like you're on your way out of business in a hurry. And I kind of formulated a question on his behalf. Is that true? Why or why not? No, no, it's not true. And and like I, I told you, you know, it's first of all, it's not a for profit business. Right. So we try to spend what we bring in. Um, second of all, 
you can look at what he's looking at as the top line, right? Mm -hmm. Top line, which is revenue for people who aren't accountants, top line and, and revenue went way down. So we must be going out of business. Well, that's not the case. Like I run five businesses, right? You can, you can make a lot of money when your revenue goes down, if you're controlling your operating expenses and doing the right things on the inside of your business, if you're reorging, if you're doing this, if you're um, changing things. So for example, the previous LNC had three and a half million in revenue, mm -hmm. but they came into convention in debt. We've had about 2 million in revenue, but we have 150,000, $140,000 in cash. Do you know what I mean? So no, we're actually doing much better from a actual pure cash flow and, and anybody who's ever run a business knows cash flow is the reason you go bankrupt, not revenue. Okay, so um, no, it's just not correct. Uh, so I get why people want to ask that question. And I, and, and I am sorry if I sound frustrated, but it's just, it's almost silly. Right. Well, I think, and, and in fairness to you and yeah. the LNC, I think what ends up happening is people aren't really asking the question. They're just slinging in insult. right yeah right. i mean essentially this is how you have to look at it basically when when october numbers come out you're going to see that our expenses are basically about the same as our revenue mm -hmm. and we've got like eight hundred thousand dollars in assets so like let's say at home you made sixty thousand and you spent sixty thousand and you had eight hundred thousand dollars of assets are you about to go bankrupt well no you're not <laughs> that's that's how all of us are if we're lucky we, right. we spend what we make and we've got a bunch of assets like so that's that's why I just kind of get frustrated with the question because it's like, no, this is perfectly right. fine. <laughs> right. And, you know, and it, look, folks, it's good to ask questions. I would never I will I will stand with anybody who's asking an honest question who isn't uh, who doesn't come across as being snarky or insulting and simply. Uh, seems to want to just dunk on people, right? Like mm -hmm. that's like if you actually care about the party and you want the party to do well, then we should ask questions even sure. tough ones. Yeah. And we should challenge people. Um, but we also want to make sure that we're asking good questions. And one of the one of my big criticisms of the critics is that I'm like, I think there are criticisms to be had, but I mm -hmm. feel like you guys are reaching for a low hanging fruit that's meaningless. Yeah. Right. You're just slinging insult. I'm like, I can't get behind that. So mm -hmm. I, I just kind of, you know, it, it appears like some people have accused me of just, you know, standing by the LNC and the, the, the Mises caucus, you know, for, uh, you know, allegiance sake. And I'm like, no, actually, I, like I would I, I, I talk privately with people and we have conversations. I'm like, yeah, that would be a legitimate criticism. But mm -hmm. that's not the kind that I'm seeing publicly. I see other right. stuff. So change the way that we do things if you actually care. Um, that way you stand out, you as the person questioning, you stand out separate from people who are just hating. Sure. Um, you know, that way, that way Todd knows who to who, who to actually address cordially. And that way he knows who to kind of thumb his nose at and be like, I don't even care. All right. Uh, here's the next thing that Steve mentioned. He said, why do expenses seem constant despite the low 2023 projections, which I think you kind of answered that a moment yeah. ago when you said, hey, look, oh. we spend what we bring in. Yeah. And this is actually a good question because uh, it goes to what we changed when we came in. Um, so we used to do straight line budgeting, which is where the ex LNC got in trouble as they, they thought they were going to spend this much and they thought they were going to make this much. And so if they were going to spend to 1.2 million, they would spend a hundred thousand dollars a month. You know, that's how they budgeted. That's not how they would spend. They might spend 150 or whatnot. What we did is very purposefully made a month by month budget and published it to the membership and said, we are going to start slow and spend low. And then as we make more money, we're going to increase our budget higher. Mm -hmm. And so when we didn't make more money, we didn't have to slash spending. We were already low. Right. So we just didn't add. And so that's why he's looking at it being like, well, they're making 80, you know, they're spending $80,000 every month, you know, but, uh, but spending or but revenue is way down. Yeah. Because we were ready for revenue to come down. We didn't think it was gonna, and we hoped it wouldn't, but we were ready to, I, I'm a big cash flow guy. I did not want our cash flow to ever be in trouble. I'd rather have our cash grow, cash flow grow $50,000 every month 
And then finally come to the LMC and be like, man, we got $300,000. We got to start spending money. You know what I mean? So. All right. Awesome. Um, so that, that takes care of my, my buddy, Steve, who was a good participant. And, 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 the, and again, the reason that I chose him is because he has no vested, he has no dog in this fight. So he is coming at it, literally looking at it just like numbers. Now he looks at it from more a business perspective and yeah. he did distinguish between, Hey, the way that your, your, your reports look or, or should look in terms of a healthy organization will be slightly different from a, no, a nonprofit and from a profit, a for-profit uh, organization. So, uh, so there's that. Now I would like to move on to some hot button issues. Now, Todd, you got to promise me not to get too angry. I know that when we talked prior, <laughs> you were like, and you were ready to fight somebody. <laughs> So, um, but, but we don't need to do that. What I want to do, folks, I am, I don't like entertaining everybody's criticism because like I said, sometimes the criticism is in bad faith. Sometimes it doesn't make any sense. Um, what have you? And I've seen plenty of it. I have seen plenty just in general where I've looked into it and I said, either you are being dishonest or you're ignorant. Not, not in this particular case, but for other matters related to the party, you know, so, um, you, you know, but when I see something repeated, you know, getting a lot of attention, then I perk up because then I, because I have to wonder, like one person making a stink, maybe they're wrong, maybe they're ignorant. When you have 10, 20, 30 people, well, then now I start to wonder, like, is there some substance to this? Yeah. And, um, you know, so what we're going to try to do is we're going to try to address these issues without ourselves selling in any mud. Okay. So God <laughs> promised to be good, uh, even though we can trust it with y'all. All right. So first one, um, on multiple occasions, I've seen the issue of FEC reports being presented as problematic. Much of that seems to be criticism over amending FEC reports. What's your response to this? Uh, it happens all the time. And I uh, forgot that that was one of your questions or I would have counted, but something like two thirds to three quarters of the previous LNC reports were also amended. Mm -hmm. It happens all the time. So what, for whatever reason, either you get more information on a donor, you have to amend, you realize that you put something in the wrong spot or you need to add something or there was a refund, you have to amend. Um, amended reports are no secret, they're all public. Anybody can go back and look at the previous LNC and see that almost every report was amended. So um, they're literally a nothing burger and the FEC yeah. doesn't care either, so. Okay, sounds good. Uh, you know, I did see that a lot. I'll be like, oh, they amended. What are you trying to hide? And I, and I was like, well, <laughs> it seems weird to me to even suggest what are you trying to hide if you've yeah. amended something. It's the opposite of hiding stuff. It's the- would suggest it's you've provided yeah. more information and say, yeah. oh, hey, by the way, yeah. Um, so that was just kind of interesting. All right. So this one, uh, so this next question, um, we're going to try to be very careful on how we, how we respond to this one because it does involve another LNC member. So okay. this one's a little bit less treasurer specific, but more related to leadership on the board. So the chair has been criticized over, uh, bringing, um, her significant other Austin Paget, over to fundraise. So my question, so this is not so much a uh, question of, you know, but you can answer it as a treasurer if you have some pertinent information. But how did this happen procedurally? And then tell me about your votes. Sure. Um, so Austin did some fundraising at, I want to say it was Freedom Fest. It was one of the summer events. Uh, he was down there doing fundraising for free mm -hmm. uh, and did a great job. And at some point in time, Angela had asked me like what I thought about it. And I said, yeah, I don't, you know, if the EPCC is fine with it, like I, contrary to popular belief, the treasurer doesn't make these decisions, right? So I gave my opinion. I said, yeah, it sounded like he did great at Freedom Fest, you know, um, and we need the help, you know, that kind of was my response. You know, looking back on it, would I have said those exact things? I don't know. Um, and, and my votes reflect that going forward. Um, mm -hmm. so, um, when it, when it kind of came to a vote on the LNC, I abstained and I told Angela, even in the meeting, like I, um, am abstaining because I did give you that advice, you know, and had I thought it through and, and realized what the general membership was going to think, I probably would have 
done something differently. You know what I mean? So I abstained on the first vote. Um, but it voted, it went through, um, and he got hired and he did a really good job. Um, and then it came up for a second vote and I voted no, um, mm -hmm. because again, same exact reasons, but then also I just didn't think it was supposed to be a long-term contract and this and that, like it just, it wasn't posed that way originally. Now there's a lot of, a lot of good reasons to vote yes. And I don't have any ill will against people who did, you know what I mean? We did have the $180,000 a month. If you can do that a couple more times, then I'm wrong. You're right. You know, mm -hmm. um, so, and I'm happy to be wrong. If that's, if that's how it all plays out, if we start kicking, kicking ass and fundraising, I'm happy to, uh, to have that be the case, but I voted no that time. Okay. Fair enough. Now I will say this is, this is where I'm going to step into my opinion. You, you don't mm -hmm. have to, you know, cause I want to make sure that we're not trying to cause any dissent or yeah. ill will um, with the LNC. Cause we, we want the LNC to function. We want the government to not be very functional. We want the LNC to be functional. <laughs> so I don't want to stir up any trouble, but I can say whatever I want because yeah. you know, it's podcast and that's what I do. Um, <laughs> in my opinion, I don't think, and, and I'm just saying this for people that would be watching to let them know where I stand on this particular matter. Um, I don't have, in general, a big issue with hiring family members. That is not generally an issue in terms of, like, should it be allowed, should it not be allowed? I don't really favor. Now, personally, I don't work well with family. So I don't work with that. Like my wife and I, she, she runs her own business. She's a real estate agent and I've tried to get with her on some things and we butt heads way too much. And so as a rule of thumb, I just try to, you know, uh, stay out of the decision-making and just kind of look at it more like, um, you know, somebody who is offering thoughtful advice, but not necessarily trying to be a part of it. Yep. So I, in my opinion, I just, I see a lot of family members where they don't necessarily work well together. So I'm a little skeptical in that particular regard. Um, on the other hand, I think it's pretty clear cut. Either somebody does a good job or they don't do a good job. Now, in this particular case, I would, if, if Angela had asked me and said, what do you think? I would have said, do not do this because you're already under enough fire right now. Yeah. Or if you are going to do it, have him, I would, I would have said, do a couple of things. Number one, show some very clear, unambiguous wins. Hey, I brought in, you know, $50,000 on one phone call, whatever. I don't know. You know, I'm just making stuff up, you know, but like, I, here's what I did. Unambiguous results that people can, that would be very hard for, um, for critics to argue against. And then I would have said, number two, make it commission based. Uh, I think that would have been the most appropriate, particularly in this environment where there's a lot of spotlight and people are basically looking for things that could potentially be wrong. Yeah. And it would have been more of a do this in light of the optics, yeah. um, but not, I don't necessarily have a problem with nepotism necessarily, especially in a smaller organization where we already yeah. struggle with volunteers. That is the problem here. You know, that's a huge problem in our organization. And, and what you just said, like Angela and I are good, by the way, Austin and I are good. I love Austin. Right. You didn't hear me say one bad thing about Angela or Austin. You heard me say a bad thing about me responding without thinking right. things. You know what I mean? So this was me going, yeah, as a treasurer, I need more money. Like, go get me more money. You know what I mean? <laughs> so, and, and, yeah. and that's, I think, you know, it's kind of funny. Uh, let, me, let me fire a little arrow at some of the critics here. We're libertarians. We believe in a free market that has a lot of flexibility. And I would argue that part of that flexibility might be like, when, uh, let me back up a wee bit for just a moment. So my understanding is that a lot of times when a CEO comes into a new company, he bring he or she brings in a lot of people that they've worked with in the past, yep. right? Yep. Like I've seen this happen repeatedly. Yep. And the reason is they want to succeed. They're bringing along people that they believe will help them succeed. Now, if that person happens to be a family member, if you have a brother that's just really good at a thing, 
if I'm the CEO and I have a brother that's just really great at fundraising and I trust him, why wouldn't I want to bring him on board, right? Um, so to me, I don't have an, I have no inherent issues with the nepotism in itself. I think that's a meaningless criticism without anything further. Right. Um, now in this environment where they're, you know, the, the LNC is struggling with membership, I don't know that that really helped. And I think the optics yeah. just made it a little bit harder. Sure. So I would have, I would have actually voted no if I was on the LNC for that reason. And I would have advised her, I would say, Hey, don't do that or hedge your bets and get yourself in a position so that it makes it harder for critics to come at you. So that makes it more obvious when critics say, say a thing against you. Right. Cause I, to me, I like to make it, I like to make it harder. Don't hand your enemies, um, you know, info on a silver platter, make them go earn it. If they're going to come at you, make them earn it. So, yep. all right. Um, last thing we got to wrap up, but, uh, you just, and I saw this today, uh, I, I did, I hadn't even looked at, but apparently you've taken some fire over some budget amendments. <laughs> so I don't want to walk through them all, but I do want to put them up on the screen sure. a little bit here and we can talk about them, uh, really quickly and just kind of get that out of the way. So okay. give me just a second here. Where's that, uh, where am I here? Uh, let me pull this up here. So. So I've got it. I'm pulling it up in two different places here so that I can read it more clearly. And then so it's also on the screen here as well. So let's see there. There we are. All right. And um, let's see, that may be hard to read. So I'm going to zoom in on that. We'll just scroll. I think that'll work there. Um, and I think we can just move you. We already know what you look like. We can move you over. <laughs> so there. Perfect. All right. So I am proposing a series of budget amendments discussed at the last meeting for approval as a group. Seeking co-sponsors. Here's the motion. Uh, pass the following budget amendments in one single vote. I'm fine with that. We don't have to discuss whether or not it should have been broke out. Um, so you've got uh, revenue budget, uh, revenue adjustments, and then expense ones. And uh, I don't think that the revenue ones. Correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't think the revenue ones really were the ones that caused a whole lot of, of issue. It was really the expenses here. So let's just go down here. And I've highlighted, I think, the important ones. The first three are kind of a collective because they're for the ballot access. So you were criticized for um, suggesting that the ballot access budget be reduced, but then you were also criticized for the budget for accounting going from 18000 to 60000 which uh, people would say, hey, like, we do this, you 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 signed on to do this job for free, you're outsourcing for the, for a cost. So let's talk about this. Let's talk about the ballot yeah. access. You, you went around and you did respond. I can appreciate that. Not always so sure some of those groups that I saw you post in. I, mean, I think it's fair of you to go in there and do that. But I kind of see them as just very yeah. hostile territory where people aren't interested in a real answer. So yeah. for the folks who might be willing to entertain your response, honestly, how do you answer the budget or uh, the ballot access? Sure. So I'm pulling up mine so I can kind of walk through it. But basically, I gave them five points on this ballot access. Um, so first of all, the equivalent year in the previous cycle was 2019. The LNC spent zero dollars on ballot access in 2019. So everything we spend this year is incremental to what we spent the equivalent year in the previous cycle. As of October, will be around 40 grand that we've spent this year already. Um, two, we budgeted an enormous amount for ballot access this year because we had retained far fewer states with ballot access during the 2020 presidential run than we had during the 2016 presidential run. And we wanted to be able to support any state that allowed early petitioning and who had a plan to do so. So that's two key things. You have to have a state that actually is allowed to petition early and then also a, a state LP that is willing to do so. If you don't have those two things, you cannot fund a petition drive. Uh, so we don't do petition drives without states helping us. Right. Okay. Um, so, so let me ask you, I want to yeah. push back maybe. I, th I think yeah. this is a pushback on that. So at the time of making that budget, Yes. Was not that information known, both pieces, the which states uh, would even allow it, because uh, I would assume that we should have that information somewhere. Um, and then uh, of those states, did we not reach out and say, hey, do you think you're going to want us to assist with ballot access? Uh, did we not know that from the outset? So a couple answers, couple answers here. 
we should have. And this is one of many things that we've actually improved that people will never see is that now we have state by state what the requirements are, when the deadlines are, when you can start, and how many signatures, and this and that in a document. That was okay. not there when I made the um, when I made the budget, nor was there any kind of estimate other than the total ballot access is probably going to cost this. Okay. And so what I did was I put as much as possible into it so that we could fund as much as possible, knowing full well that if we put too much in, we could move 100,000 from there into something else. That was the plan. The plan was never to just cut it, but revenue didn't come through. So that's where we are. Gotcha. So you threw the sink at it um, with lacking information at the time. And then between that time and uh, today, um, that information has been acquired. And now we, we have Correct. a better insight on which states now is that information that we can where can i find that information so uh the ballot access committee i'm trying to remember if those meetings are open or require an invite i'm on the ballot access committee and we've always invited people mm -hmm. i'm a, i'm assuming they are not open i don't know if that's something we're willing to publish or not i'd have to talk to the committee chair um but but basically, I'm on that committee. I know exactly how much we could spend this year. It's less than 80. So this right. this petitioning cut uh, is, an, is nothing. It doesn't mean anything. There will be nothing that we can't fund because of this cut. Gotcha. And I, and I think I saw in some of your responses that you said, hey, we've we've reduced the budget for now, but we can add the we, you know, we can update the budget at a later time going into 2024. Um, which I would anticipate. So it has the LNC started to reach out to the state affiliates that might need some ballot access assistance? Yes. Yes. So okay. we're working on plenty of different states. We've already started drives or finished drives in Arkansas, North Dakota, Maine, Ohio. We funded, we partially funded a lawsuit in Tennessee. So we're in five states already. We know what the next states are. You know what I mean? Like, we have this all lined out. We know what states think they can fund themselves, which means they have nothing from us. Um, we know what states don't want help from us and what states do. You know what I mean? There's there's states that don't want help from the LNC for whatever reason. And, and so like all that stuff plays into the budgeting of ballot access. It's not a simple thing, but yes, for sure, another huge portion of next year's budget is going to be ballot access. That's for sure. Okay. Okay. So all... All criticism that the LNC is not working toward ballot access is nonsense. The, the main things I would say, yes. Yeah. So first of all, yes. Any criticism that we're not working on ballot access is nonsense. We've literally funded five states. Um, and there is not a sixth state that could have been funded this year. So we funded okay. every state. Um, and, the, and then the highlights there are, this 80,000, 5,000, and 0,000 will fund everything that we have planned. Nothing will okay. not get funded. Um, and so, yeah, I don't, there, you know, I get the criticism, but it's only because they don't know that this will fund every single thing that we could possibly fund. <laughs> so, uh, and, and this is good information to have because if I were to look at this without yeah. knowing this, I would have. I would have been susceptible to people saying, hey, we're not doing ballot, you know, the LNC is not taking care of ballot access. Yeah. And so then I would have been like, whoa, well, what gives? Mm -hmm. I don't understand. Yeah. Right. So so I think these, you know, I think this information is good to get out there. Um, now, let's let's talk about the last one. Then we're going to wrap it up because I try to keep the show toward an hour and I want to respect yeah. your time. Uh, what's going on with the accounting increasing yeah. from 18,000 to 60,000, which has been criticized that we're now paying somebody else to do your job. Yeah, so <laughs> so let me start with that first part because it's funny, The my job, people don't understand what a treasurer does. Uh, so let's mm -hmm. just talk about that for a couple of minutes quick and then I'll jump into mm -hmm. the accounting. Um, so people think that treasurer does the QuickBooks and they cut the checks and they might choose the vendors and, you know, and maybe even do some hiring and firing of staff. No, the treasurer does, none of those things at all. What the treasurer does is they make the budgets, they amend the budgets, they file 
the reports, which by the way, a third party does the report and then I review it and say, yes, you can file it. And then after that stuff, we are analyzing numbers and making recommendations. Do you know what I mean? So mm -hmm. that's what a treasurer does. None of that is what an accountant does. Okay. Accountant has never been that. Okay, the ops director in the past has done the accounting for us, which has caused a number of issues. Um, and so what I did in this year's budget is I put in $18,000 for accounting because we were thinking at some point we would outsource it. We didn't know if that was going to be at the beginning of the year or at the end of the year. And I didn't want to put in $100,000 for accounting because we didn't think it was going to be at the beginning of the year. Mm -hmm. So I literally had no idea when we were going to do it, but we were going to outsource accounting for a couple of reasons. When you outsource accounting, you take that um, basically knowledge and, and responsibility off of one person. So if that person goes on vacation, you don't suddenly can't file a FEC report. You know what I mean? Um, if that person leaves the organization like he did, you can't file an FEC report suddenly. You know what I mean? Like this is why you want a third party in charge of your accounting so that we can do FEC reports and we can get financials out in a timely manner, no matter who knows what inside the organization. Um, so then we hired this accounting firm. Um, and there were a couple of reasons it got expensive. One, the key person left the organization. So suddenly we had to basically dump a ton of stuff on them in a hurry. Okay. Um, and that is expensive for anybody who's run a business. They know, you know, whenever you hire a professional to do something faster than normal, it costs more money. So, so that was one problem. Second problem is the FEC was a whole different animal for this accounting firm. They had never dealt with that before. So that caused a large learning curve with many more hours and professionals work by the hour. So okay. there's what's called an onboarding where you onboard an accountant and it's more expensive at the beginning. And then after that, it levels off. We have gotten through okay. the onboarding and we now leveled off. The other thing we did inside of this was we moved to QuickBooks Online, which we were always told would be impossible, but is crucial because if you had asked me what did we spend the $21,000 of this and that on in October? I could not tell you because I had not, I didn't have access, but now I do. I can go onto QuickBooks yeah. Online on my phone and I can tell you exactly what the charges were. Do you know what I mean? And so it's crucial mm -hmm. that people inside the organization, key people have access to this so that we can make better decisions, catch things when we're going in the wrong direction. And so, the things that we've done inside of accounting, moving it to a third party, getting us onto QuickBooks Online, are going to pay dividends for years and multiple LNCs to come. Am I happy that we are moving it up to sixty thousand? No, I think it should have been more like thirty or forty, and I'm not very happy that the prices went way up. Do I understand why they went way up? Yes, because I saw how many hours they had to put in to untangle the complete mess that we dropped on them. Okay. So let me ask you if these two criticisms would be fair. We don't have to address them. You can you can if you want, if there's something meaningful to say. Um, number one, um, you mentioned that there was a loss of, um, uh, you know, we had people leave and they took their knowledge with them. So that was a, a problem. So it seems to me that one criticism might be, hey, the, uh, the LNC or the Mises Caucus or however we want to look at it, the leadership, um, they were functioning in a way that caused people that had institutional knowledge to leave. And so fair therefore one. that would, that would be a fair and valid criticism. Yes. Valid criticism. On the other hand, I think it would be, and this wouldn't be limited to this particular LNC. The fact that our institutional knowledge was so, um, tied up into one or two people or handful of people, um, would that also represent a bit of a problem? Like we should be more resilient because what if a bunch of people for whatever other reason, not infighting needed to leave in a short amount of time, that would put us in that same situation, correct? Correct. Which is why we had planned the outsourcing to begin with. Okay. So yes, both are very valid criticisms. One was planned for, which was the outsourcing. One wasn't, which was the leaving. You know what I mean? So 
Right. Um, but yeah, I mean, and I'm not blaming anybody. Like they're, you know, our employees do an incredible job and they deal right. with a lot and they had a lot more things on their plate than just accounting. You know what I mean? And right. so he wasn't doing accounting the full time. It's not his yeah. fault. He wasn't. Yeah. In and and, and, and know, none of this is to be yeah. suggestive of any particular person as being a problem. What I'm looking at, I like to look at the processes that are in place yeah. and say, what processes led to this? Some of those yeah. are going to be on the shoulders of the LNC potentially. Um, as we just acknowledge, yeah. and then some of them are going to be on past LNCs. Like, hey, why didn't we foresee this as a potential problem? Right. That's right. Um, yeah. When I brought this to the LNC, it was basically like, guys, I want to outsource accounting. Mm -hmm. Laney agrees. Angela agrees. We have no idea when we're going to do it, so I picked a number. You know what so I mean? Like, my my other question about that same thing is, I think I heard you correctly. You said the firm that we hired out to. They had a learning curve for the FEC. So did we not pick the right firm? Should we have picked a firm that had more FEC knowledge? And so therefore that part of the learning curve, or was it a learning curve specific to our organization? Specific to our organization. That's a great question and a fair question. Uh, but what happens is we have an FEC consultant that puts together our report. So that's not what we're talking about here. What we're talking about is the output that goes to that consultant. Mm -hmm. And the output is very, very specific to CIBI CRM. Okay. And, and quite frankly, I, I have no qualms in telling you that the accountant said that CIBI CRM cost us a lot of money. Okay. Because basically they had to learn it. Do you know what I mean? They had to mm -hmm. learn. And we have a different version of CIBI CRM than is out there in the public. Like we built our own. And we've got these books of like, this is how you pull everything. You know what I mean? And and they just had to learn it. And it just took hours of professional services. You know what I mean? And so, and, and again, if we went to a different accountant, we'd have to learn it again, you know? And so like, eventually when this was going to get outsourced, eventually these costs were going to come, you know, had it been done 10, 15 years ago, the cost would have been a third because of inflation, you know, but now we didn't and it's 60 grand. So. Got it. So final question on that. When can members and how will members be able to see a return on that money? On the accounting money? Yeah. Like, like yeah. how will they be able to know, Hey, that would like, yeah. we can criticize now and say, Oh, should we have spent that money? Blah, blah, blah. But then if we say, all right, it needed to be done. Well, at what point will members be able to look back and say, you know what? Turns out that was, it was painful but it was, it would ended up being a good thing. How do they we will never be able to see a return on investment on accounting dollars. What okay. you'll see, what you'll see silently is the next time our ops manager leaves, the next time a different caucus takes over and everybody turns over, you know, the next time our FEC person leaves and this and that, you'll keep getting consistent numbers at the right time. And they'll always look the same and no matter who is in the seats, like the next chair will be able to learn from the accountant, not the other way around. Do you know what I mean? Got so it. that's what you'll see. The LNC and the staff will notice it. You will never notice it. And that is the entire point. Do you know what I mean? We don't have to, like if we have a, you know, a employee making X and he, and he quits and then we have to hire somebody that does all this stuff you know, and maybe in the marketplace, that's why, you know, yeah, we've just saved a bunch of money. Are you ever going to see that? No, you know, because we don't have to, we don't have to buy that skill set right now. Do you know what I'm saying? Like, absolutely. Um, but you just eyes wide open. There's not a thing that you're going to be able to point to. So. Gotcha. It's going to be one of those things where since it didn't happen, uh, that will be the return. Um, but unfortunately, you won't be, that's not something you can see because, when does this when does a negative thing happen and if a negative thing never happens then it's it, also it's, it's also an 80 20 activity right so like now nobody in our organization is doing accounting every day and so they gotcha. were before and now they're doing something else so gotcha. we're either getting more done or we have less employees you know what I mean? Fewer employees. One of those two things is going to happen going forward. So there's an inherent savings. But again, you're never going to want to 
point to it and be like, hey, we saved ahead there, or hey, this we kicked out 18 more fundraising emails throughout the three months there. Like, it's just hard to point to that. So, got it. All right, fair enough. Uh, final words before I close the show out. No, I mean, thank you for having me. These are important discussions. Obviously, you know, people are either going to believe me or not, but again, mm -hmm. just email me, treasure at lp.org. Um, I will answer your question. And if it's a good question, I'll post it on the list so that everyone can see the Q&A. So. Okay. Well, you hang back backstage. Let me close the yep. show out. And then we'll, we'll chit chat for a minute or two. And then we'll both be on our way. Yep. Folks, I hope you enjoyed watching. And I hope you got something out of this episode. I want you to be sure to catch me every morning, Monday through Friday, 7 a.m. Eastern time for an informed discussion on politics and culture, except for this week. This week, I am taking some downtime so that I can work on some technical things behind the scenes. Uh, similarly, there are things that you may or may not see much of a return on. So hopefully your wait will still be worth it. Um, but Monday mornings, Monday through Friday morning, 7 a.m. Eastern time for an informed discussion, politics and culture. And then on Sunday nights at 7 p.m. where I bring on Susan Hogarth, we discuss LP happenings. We look across the vastness of tyranny that exists in this United States. And we say, what in the world is the Libertarian Party doing? And we bring that information to you every week on Sunday at 7 p.m. Be sure to do all the proper audience actions. Subscribe to my YouTube channel. Subscribe to me on Rumble. You can go to youtube.libertydad.com, rumble.libertydad.com. You can find me there. Subscribe, like the videos, drop in a comment. Let me know. Um, don't drop any comments necessarily to Todd. Send them directly to him. Uh, because I don't know that I can guarantee that I will take the comments, you know, any comments directed to him from uh, this episode and get them to him. But otherwise, I do try to read the comments. Otherwise, remember, if you're a champion of liberty, your business is people and your product is liberty. I want you to have a great week. Catch you next time. Next time being this Sunday coming up 